Okay, so um, you can check you can check your git ignore with the git ignore which is posted on the wiki as well. So the the one on the wiki is a little bit bigger than the one which is auto generated when you generate the project. Um, have you checked the command line? Yeah, the command line. Yeah, exactly. It should work. It should have an effect. Um, so. It's kind of useful to not commit binaries and generated files in the project. So yeah, pay attention to, to what you have inside the git ignore. I will just make it a bit bigger. Um, OK, so what, what we will do, because some of you already had Java, uh, so I will turn it around. So I will first talk about the conventions, and then I will talk about the Java. In, uh, yeah, let, we, we, we do three things. So first I will talk about the conventions, then Chris will talk a little bit about the UI and the lock card and how you debug your app and where everything is the, in the UI. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about the Java. So we, those people who already know Java, they can skip the last part. Um, so I go to my slides. So as I said, um, every language has its own sort of uh, conventions and its own ways of doing things. Um, so you can check the Java coding conventions, and Android has very similar ones. Um, so um, it's not a big deal. I mean, if you do violate some of the conventions, that's, that's not a big deal. But you need to understand why do we have conventions. So can you tell me why do we have, you know, coding conventions in general? Yeah. yeah, exactly. What else? So collaboration between people. If you go to to this document, uh, section one dot one is why we have conventions, and they list, um, you know four things and it kind of boils down to what you just said that we writing code to be read and we but being developers we read a lot of code right so if if people kind of follow the conventions it's much easier to read it and it's much easier to see how the code works and it's kind of familiar right um, so we do follow the conventions to make it easier to read and understand the code um, so that's point number three, <laughs> basically. So it boils down to this point number three, uh, readability, improved readability, and ease of, of access. Um, right. So you should follow the rules, uh, and there are some rules that we kind of enforce. Uh, so if, if we see that you're kind of violating some of the rules, we will tell you off, right? So we say, don't do that. Do, do that according to the conventions. Uh, some rules you can agree with your team. So when you're working on a project, you can say, OK, we set those rules for ourselves. Uh, try not to violate the core rules, which are sort of in the Java coding conventions. Some things are sort of negotiable. Uh, but some rules are sort of there, right? So if you decided, okay, we're going to use the, the C++ style of braces, uh, well, you should not do that. Like, everybody in Java uses the same style as Go, Golang. So then you should stick to the braces in, in Golang. But you can say, uh, we, we're going to prefix all the member fields with M underscore something, right? And a lot of Android projects do that. Uh, you, you can do that, and that, that's fine. That's one sort of a convention which you can use. Um, all right. It, we, we've discussed that before as well, that when you're coding, you're coding for readability and maintainability. You don't code to make things fast. Uh, optimization of the code, that's a different task. That's a different set of skills, and different people are doing that, and for different reasons, right? When you're programming, you're programming to express an algorithm, to express how things should work. You're not expressing it for speed. You're expressing it for readability and maintainability. Uh, of course, um, 
we don't want people to do stupid things, right? So as a professional programmer or developer, you are sort of using the, the constructs which kind of make sense. So you don't um, do, you know, um, trivial mistakes, for example, like Simon always makes the, the example of uh, someone doing an update and not using the primary key to find the record which needs to be updated in SQL query. It's super inefficient, right? Because if you don't do that, then the, the engine has to do much more work to find which records need to be updated. If you do include the primary key, then it's just one and that's super fast because you have it indexed, right? Uh, so you sort of know that, right? So don't make mistakes, but don't optimize your code for performance. Um, the point here um, about camel case naming, it, it is sort of a, yeah, it's a convention that everybody in Java uses as well, right? So don't use underscore naming conventions, use camel case. We've, we've used the same in Go. Uh, in Golang, we also use the kind of a camel case naming convention. Um, the exception is, as I said, m underscore some uh, member uh, variable name. Usually that's okay to, to have m underscore something. <coughs> um, okay, in Java, a lot of things happen automatically. And then it's from upon if you do say what is automatically happening yourself, right? So Java in itself is a very verbose language. You have to write a lot of code to express what you mean. Then the little bits which Java does for you, then you don't repeat that because that makes it even more verbose, okay? So for example, you don't call super, like if you're calling a constructor and in the first line of your constructor, you say super, you call the parent constructor. Don't do that. Super with braces is always called automatically, right? You don't have to call it. It will be called automatically and everybody knows that. So don't put that extra line in the code. It makes the code one line shorter, right? Um, don't initialize you know, variables to zero. They are always initialized to zero. Don't initialize pointer variables to null. They always null when you declare them, right? So things that make no sense to say, don't say it. Um, so all the public constructors are also generated for you, right? If you have a class, uh, and you have no constructors, a <coughs> default public empty constructor is generated for you. So don't say, I have class A and I have a public A constructor which does nothing, okay? That they may, makes no sense. It, it, it's always there, um, even if you don't say it. Unless you have another constructor, right? So if you do have some constructors, then sometimes you have to have, um, um, yeah, like, if, if it doesn't happen automatically, then you have to say it. But if it happen, happens automatically, don't say it. Um, all the um, access modifiers in interfaces are, are the, um, like implicitly specified, right? So don't say that something is public uh, in the interface because everything in the interface is public, right? Um, so when you're declaring your interface, skip all the, the things that don't have to be there. The linter in Android Studio does a very good job. It will say, okay, you don't have to say that because it is public by default. You don't need that constructor because it's there, right? So some things which I'm talking about, the linter already picks up and, and con complains, um, but some, um, some things you have to enforce yourself. Um, the point why we do, follow these rules, I already said that, you know, Java is verbose enough and if you're even making it even more verbose, that's, you know, that's too much. Uh, so stick to what has to be said and don't include anything else that need, doesn't need to be there. Does it make sense? So for those of you who programmed in Java and are used to specifying that, okay, I have int i that is zero, okay, stop doing that. Uh, if you ever called super with uh, empty braces in your own constructor, stop doing that. Uh, don't declare the empty constructors if you don't have to, uh, and so on. So sometimes you want to declare an empty constructor. When would that be the case? Okay. Yeah. So let's say you have a class. It doesn't have any other constructors, but you will 
uh, declare an empty constructor? When would you do that? Yeah, so you want to make a singleton, for example, and you want to prevent people calling the constructor, then you want to make it private, right? Yeah, it's the same here. So that's one case. Uh, what would be the other case? I was thinking about that case. What's the other case? Um, if you want, yeah, if you want to have multiple constructors, including the default constructor. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So in the case that you only have one, that's the case. If you have multiple constructors and you want to have a default public constructor, then you have to declare it, right? Because otherwise it's not there. Um, so it's the same as, as in, in C++ in that regard. All right. Um, we've been over that a little bit uh, when we were discussing Go. Uh, Java is a little bit different because the, it uses the sort of uh, type then variable names. Um, so, um, and also in Java, it's frowned upon if you declare things in the same line, right? So usually if you have to declare two things, you have to say int w int h, right? Why, why we do that? Because when you're scanning the code, it's easier to read and easier to register which variables you have in the code, right? You always have type name, type name, type name, right? If there is a type name, 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 it's like, whoa, it's too much information at once, right? Uh, when you're scanning the code, you have to stop and think and kind of uh, read it, right? You can't just scan. So it's much better if you use declaration per line, yeah? But in that case, clearly with a type, isn't that sort of more um, acceptable? Yeah, so you know, in that particular, particular case, with <laughs> width and height, that would be kind of okay, so yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, so this example is kind of not good. A good point because it is kind of clear what it is, right? You can scan through it and you see, oh yeah, with and height, blah blah blah, right? Um, but this one, yeah, that one is wrong, right? Clearly. And also the the example here says that okay, you know what what with and height of what, right? If it's really clear from the context, that's great. But maybe you should say this. Maybe you should say box width and box height, right? Um, so go is really stressing very short names for variables, right? So in Go, this would be perfect, right? In Java, this tends to happen, right? So Java stresses more verbosity and kind of more um, uh, semantically rich naming. Um, so they, they, they have a slightly different feel. Like in Go, you often work with, you know, W and H, width and height, perfect. Uh, with Java, yeah, you tend to see this more, right? Uh, people are a little bit more verbose and um, methods for for some public things are slightly longer and they, they kind of more descriptive, right? It's not as bizarre as with Objective-C, but it, it is a little bit more than Go, right? So Go tends to be more succinct, more sort of a shorter things, more, um, uh, I don't know, yeah, say shorter. Uh, Java is a little bit longer, but not as long as the... Any of you work with Objective-C? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are amazing, right? It's like you're reading like a, you know, uh, a novel. <laughs> um, okay, so... So let's say yeah, we're doing more descriptive names, so we, we've done those two lines. Let's say we have a scene width and seal height, um, and we've used those numbers. Is it good? No, it's not too good. It's magic numbers, right? Where the magic numbers come from? You should use constants, because if you ever want to change those dimensions, you should change them in one place. You shouldn't have them sprinkled all uh, over the, the code. So maybe this is, those are the constants, right? The scene width and scene height are the, the, the constants that you're referring to in the code. And then you just uh, initializing them once in one place and then you only need to change that, right? Um, Java, unfortunately, doesn't have .h files. So the, you know, doing constants in Java is a constant uh, source of debate. How you, how you do constants, right? Um, 
So we will come back to that in a minute. Um, loops the same as in Golang, uh, short names starting from I, you know, I, J, K, L, like in most looping languages, uh, perfectly fine. It's better if you declare it inside the loop, right? So you contain the scoping of the variable to, uh, to the loop instead of de pre-declaring it before, right? Um, when would you predefine it before? Sometimes you want to break out of the loop and you want to see at which index you break out, then you have to have it outside. Because then if you declare it in this context, in that scope, then it will not be available outside, right? Once you break out of the loop. But a note, uh, you, sh you should use range loops. You have range loops now in C++ as well. So the concept is the same and the pre uh, prescription for using range loops in C++ is the same. Like if you're doing C++, you should use range loops everywhere you can. Um, why we do that? Why we push using range loops instead of the kind of iterative loops like this with index? Exactly, to avoid some problems with out of bound indexes, right? Um, that's, that's the main reason. What's the other reason? Yeah. It's easier to read, yes. So it's kind of more succinct expression. It's kind of cl clearer to see. Oh yeah, I'm iterating over that list, right? It, it's mentally much com much less complex than saying, oh yeah, I have this index from here to there and like with this condition. And uh, you know, there is much more information to parse when you're reading loop like that instead of you said, okay, iterate over all the pixels from for the scene, right? Um, along the, the width of the pic of the scene. Then that, you know, mentally it's sort of simpler. So that's the second reason. What's the other reason? Both are great and both are very important. What's the other reason we do that, yeah? Say it again. Exactly. So because we're declaring, okay, we're gonna iterate over a particular data structure, um, the runtime system knows what we're doing, right? We don't have kind of a condition that it needs to parse. We don't have, you know, starting an endpoint that we can fiddle with. Uh, and we don't have the increment that we can fiddle with. So the range loops are sort of much more, uh, they are simpler and they are always the same. So then the runtime system can be optimized to make them faster, right? Because there is not much room for interpretation of what the programmer wants. It's kind of always the same thing, right? So the runtime system can do more things and especially modern architectures, they have um, you know, multi-core support and things can be parallelized. So if I'm iterating over a particular collection, in theory, the runtime system can say, oh, you, you know, we can parallelize it, right? Because the, the user doesn't specify the order. It says, okay, I want to iterate over that list, right? I want, I don't know, let's say I have some sort of a pixel along the width. And I say, I want to process every pixel along the, the, the width, right? In which order I do that, I don't say. I don't say start from pixel zero to pixel, you know, n, right? So then things can be done out of order and also things can be done in parallel, right? So my loop can actually execute much faster. So the, the argument about always using range loops is significant, especially if the runtime system benefits from it and makes the code run faster. So that's, that's a very good point. All right, so braces, we talked about it. You kind of do the go length style braces. Um, some people hate it, some people like it. I mean, some languages use it, like Go enforces it. In Go, it's a syntax error if you don't do that, right? In C++, uh, whatever, you do whatever you want. Um, so that's also quite interesting because when I started, um, um, yeah, when I started, I actually my, my first programming language was assembly, right? So then there was a macro assembler. It's like, whoa, huge, I have macros. Now you add not, it's so not as verbose as the normal assembly, right? It was a huge step. Um, and then I was programming in basic, which kind of in the retrospect, it sucked, but compared to assembly, basic was awesome. Um, then was Pascal with the begin and end shit. Right? You actually have to say begin and end. <laughs> 
for everything, every every block. Uh, so then, in retrospect, that sucked big time. And then I started programming in uh, in C and C plus plus. And for many years, I, I've been doing that. And then Java came along, and Java kind of forced people to do certain conventions. And then it was noticeable to read Java code which was not written by me to be so easy to read, right? Um, like reading different people's C++ code was always a struggle. Everybody uses different, you know, operator overloading, different coding conventions, different things. And then jumping from code base to code base was always a struggle. You always waste a lot of time reading and getting used to the way a particular library or particular developer works. Uh, in Java, it was like almost, almost always the same, right? So the same experience I had with Python because it enforces certain things to be done the same way, right? So it was so you know very easy to read somebody else's code because it looked like yours. It looked like yours code, right? So I don't have any objection of people using braces this way or the other way. It's just the consistency, right? It really helps. Uh, so in C++, if everybody uses C++ braces convention, that's fine. I get used to it and it, that's what I expect. But in Java, I kind of expect this, and I'm fine with that as well. And in Go, now, you know, you expect that because there is no other way. Um, but I don't think um, it sort of matters. Some people argue that one is fundamentally better than the other. I don't think it matters. I think the consistency trumps any small benefits of one over the other, right? If there is a benefit of one over the other, it's so small that it doesn't matter compared to the consistency of having one consistent convention. All right, uh, yeah, we talked about it in Golang as well. If you can avoid else, avoid it, right? So if you can rewrite your code without else, do that. Uh, it you almost always helps, right? Um, so there is an example here, which is often the case, you know, you check, okay, if parameter is more, or, more than or equal to zero, then do stuff. Otherwise, it's an error condition, right? Then throw an exception, right? And the problem with that is that this is often deep and deep somewhere, and it's sort of not obvious of what is happening, right? So you're sort of analyzing, scanning this code, and then there is an else called close, and you kind of don't really remember what that else was for. You don't remember the exact condition, why this else will happen, right? So it's so much easier if you do that, right? You know, you have the condition right here, that's the error condition, and you have the behavior right there in your face. You can always scan back and forth, you know, with your eyes. And then if there is no error, you know, you do your normal thing, right? Um, so, you know, rewriting that to that is better. Uh, there are some cases where having an else clause is necessary, but almost always you can uh, avoid it. Okay, so... Um, Java is a very strongly object-oriented language. You, you don't have like uh, first-class methods um, or functions. You do have lambda functions and you have anonymous functions, but it is kind of uh, really strongly object-oriented. Um, back in the day when it was sort of designed, uh, people felt that object orientation is the good metaphor and it's the best way of doing software development. Uh, it's the best abstractions that we got. Uh, and back in the day, it looked like it, it's much better to what we had before, right? So compared to C with structs, um, C++ was an improvement, and then Java was even better, bigger improvement over C++ because C++ is still a bit of a mixed environment. Java is kind of exclusively object-oriented. Uh, but it has some problems, right? So there is a ton of useful things you can do with object orientation, and those useful things are kind of grouped into design patterns. So we have certain um, default, default ways of doing things, and they are called design patterns, usually in object-oriented fashion. We have design patterns in functional programming uh, as well, but those are typically for object-oriented designs. And the reason why I'm kind of mentioning it because Android and uh, and even iOS, they take advantage of it and they are engineered somewhat around design patterns, right? So MVC, for example, heavily used in iOS is a design pattern. You can use MVC on Android as well. Um, 
and then there is a dele delegate pattern, there is a facade pattern, there is a manager pattern, and those patterns you see in the code, in the APIs. They sort of, uh, Android takes uh, advantage of it, of those well-defined and well-suited <coughs> patterns for particular tasks. So for example, there is an observer pattern, and you have observable interface where you can observe a change state of a particular instance of the class, and it's built in into Java, right? <laughs> There is, um, you know, event mechanisms for uh, event listener. It's also a pattern. Um, so there is a ton of useful patterns. And then usually when you have a problem at hand, you, you start thinking about, okay, au automatically what sort of patterns fit to solve it, right? And that's a very good thing for, for two reasons. One reason is that those patterns are sort of well proven to suit particular need. Um, so they avoid some of the pitfalls if you do it otherwise. Um, the second useful thing is that because all programmers sort of know the patterns, it's kind of easy to understand what's happening, right? So if you say, I'm, I'm using um, uh, observer, observer pattern for this, then it's obvious what's happening, right? Uh, if, if you don't say that, or if you don't follow up the pattern how it should be, Usually you're doing it in suboptimal way and you're bringing kind of a burden for the other developers to understand of what is happening. So it's sort of like mental shortcuts which work, which have, have been proven and they are very useful, right? Um, there are some anti-patterns. So there are patterns which we often fall into and they don't work against us, right? Yeah? The link, the return pattern link is missing now. So it's, it's a different issue for me. Okay. Design patterns, yes, you're right. Good point. So let <laughs> um, link fixed. Thanks for the for spotting it. Okay. Um, Right, so as a homework, you can think of what, what's wrong with uh, singletons, okay? Uh, so singleton is often considered kind of a very useful pattern for game development, and we do use it uh, a lot. Uh, you know, you have a single keyboard. Why wouldn't you use singleton for representing a keyboard, right? You have a single screen. Why wouldn't you use singleton for representing the screen? Um, well, you know, fair enough. So there are useful cases where singleton is sort of a, a useful thing. But often singleton is used to um, prevent a better design, which avoids having kind of a global variables and global context, right? We use, we pretend, oh yeah, we're using good patterns, so we use singleton, but in fact, we're having kind of the global, you know, variables and global state, which is sort of an anti-pattern, right? Uh, so singleton can be used for good and can be used for bad things. Um, so we don't use uh, singleton to, um, to represent the global state, we prefer to use a pattern called dependency injection, for example, to sort of um, make it more robust and more uh, pluggable, so then we can mock things and test things better, right? If you don't have a global state where everybody knows where to get things from, but instead, instead you kind of inject the dependencies to particular modules or particular classes or calls, then it's so much easier to test them in isolation because you can always inject a mock, right? So if someone depends on the keyboard, you can inject a mock of a keyboard and pretend to be clicking some keys and then test whether the behavior is what you expect. If you have a global keyboard handler or um, key keyboard um, singleton where everybody knows I have to get the keys from, the, from that global one, it's so much diff difficult to test it in isolation because how would you do that if it's hardwired to this global thing, right? Um, so sometimes we do that because we don't test and we prefer performance. And often that's the case in games um, where we cut corners and we kind of do a little bit less um, uh, proper things to gain a little bit more performance. Uh, but as we were having on the first slide, we don't optimize for performance when we're writing code, right, normally. So you should do proper things and then only optimize when you need it. Um, so check those patterns, check those um, designs. 
and you will see uh, if you are not familiar with them you know don't get overwhelmed that oh yeah there is so many of them they usually very trivial if you read you know what they do it, it's kind of trivial and you don't need to learn all of them at once you can sort of uh, learn them as you go uh, and as you need them and pay attention to how Android framework use them as well they usually have the the hint of which pattern uh, is being used with the naming convention so things are called managers things are called you know observers and, and things like this all right so we got to the constants so in c++ it's super trivial you know how you deal with constants well you stuff them into dot h file and then you include them where they are needed right uh, but java doesn't have dot h file so how do you constants in java well you know, we, we don't know. Um, so initially, uh, people were just putting all the constants into the interface and then, you know, implementing the interface, right? So if you have a couple of constants that you need, let's say you need the width and height of your, of your screen, I don't know, uh, the name server name for the backend server, then you put, you make an interface called constants, you implement those uh, three constants in there, and then if you have a class which needs one of those constants in your class, you say, my class implements that constants interface and then I have access to those three constants, right? Um, so that was kind of good. Uh, people were using it, but it was run upon that, you know, you misleading the, the reader thinking that this class implements something in which in fact, it doesn't actually implement anything. It just uses the constants, right? So people stopped saying, okay, my class implements that interface. Instead, you specifically say, you know, constant dot width, right? And then you refer to the constant by prefixing it with the class name, interface name, and say constant dot width is my constant, right? And it's still an interface. But then people were also saying, well, actually you're misleading the reader because constant is not really an interface, right? It's not really a way of interacting with anything. So you're abusing the concept of interface to declare those constants, right? So they say, well, it should be really a class, right? It should be like a final static class that has a, a number of static fields. And then you say constants dot blah, 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 right? So, you know, generally you do that, right? So generally if you need constants, you have to have sort of a, a class with private constructor, which cannot be instantiated um you can use a singleton if you want and then or just static fields uh, and static class where you just say constants dot and some constant names right so that's the sort of the the way of doing constants now but you will see if you're using libraries and if you're using somebody else's code you will see other people doing one of the other methods as well right often um, i think it's permissible if you make uh, constants part of your API, then you can do them in the interface, right? So the, the idea is that everything that's in the interface is still part of your uh, usable API, API for your library, right? So if you make constants part of it, only part of it, then it's okay. I mean, that's correct. Yes. So what's the, I mean, yeah. unless you oppose that view, but because the, oftentimes your constants which you shouldn't be public, right? So they're only used within, but they're not part of the API. That's Therefore, right. Therefore, it shouldn't appear in an interface. That's right. Yes. So did you understand that? So if, you, if your constants are part of the a, or public API that you kind of expose your library to, so let's say you're, um, I don't know, let's say you're developing some sort of library and your library has a version number and the version number is a constant, that is part of the interface of where you, how you're interacting with the library and that is okay to include it in the interface to your library, right? Um, but all the constants which are internal to the library should not be exposed outside, so they should not be part, part of the public interface. And usually you deal with them using a class, private class to the module that you're developing, to the package. Um, so, yeah, questions about that? Yeah? Colon, colon, dot, dot, dot. So, always. So in Java, everything is dot. There is no colon, colon. So the, the syntax is slightly different to, uh, to, to C++ and you refer to things regardless, always with dot. So then to distinguish between instance and static, you don't, you can't, you can't. Isn't, I, I've seen in, isn't it like in C++ that uh, capital number is protected, I mean capital is equal to capital number. 
Correct. So, so there is a convention where it's not enforced, right? So it's just a coding convention uh, that the normal methods in Java have a small letter and the static ones have starts with cap, capital letter, uh, which is sort of the opposite to, uh, because in C-sharp all the public interfaces are with start, methods start with capital letter and the internal ones with small, right? Um, so it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit confusing, but typically all the static fields or static methods starts with capital letter in Java. That's correct. But again, you will notice that not everybody follows that, and not all the libraries sort of uh, follow that that convention. It's just a convention. It's not enforced. Um, it's useful if you prefix things that refer to the instance with this. Right? even if you don't have to, because that also highlights that it is an instance method or instance field, right? Um, whereas um, the static ones, you have to have the class name or something, and all the class names start with capital type anyway, right? So if you see constant with capital C dot something with capital letter, you almost always can be sure that, okay, that's static, static access. Um, all right, so what would be wrong with that, with that declaration of the app name if I were to put it into the interface? Those of you who know Java. So who knows Java? Yeah, so what's wrong with that line if it's inside the interface? Yeah, so you shouldn't write public because you don't have to. It's by default public. What else? That one. Good. What else? There are three things wrong with that line. Come on. Yeah? Uh, so that's the fourth one, but typically for the constants, you, you capitalize the constants and you use the underscore, right? So if you're doing kind of a global constants type of thing, Java allows you to use all caps. Um, it will not complain, like in Golang, the linter complains, oh, yeah, don't, no, don't do all caps. But in Java, we often do that, right? So um, that's up for discussion, but a lot of teams agree that if you have some global constants, you can use all caps to distinguish them from something else, right? So then you have to use underscore to, to, to do that. So that, that I wouldn't count as one of those three things. So what else, yeah? Uh, well, if it is part of the interface, you have to, right? So inside the interface, there is no other way to initialize a, a field, right? Um, so the first one is you don't use public because everything in the interfaces is public. And if it's a field, it's final by default as well. So you don't say public and final, right? Uh, can I have a static thing inside the interface? Can anything in the interface be static? What's that? It, it doesn't, exactly. So things in the interface cannot be static. Right by by definition of the interface, right. So the three wrong things with that line, if it was inside the interface, is that all the three first words cannot be there, right? The 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 public and final because of the convention, because you should not say things that are default, right? So public final is the default, uh, so you don't repeat it, uh, and then the static cannot be there because you cannot have static things in the interfaces. Interfaces are about instance behaviors and instance fields, and therefore, you know, um, you cannot declare something to be static. Uh, so if, if, um, if you are declaring an app name constants inside the interface, you, just, you would just say string app name bold, right? Um, I think when you, if you're a demo, when you say like, uh, one of the 
Ja. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it depends on the setup of the linter, I guess. Yeah. Um, so now the final and public are, uh, you cannot have non-final fields inside the interface. And you cannot have non-public things inside the interface. So, you know, those two things are always there by default. Okay, also you may have some linter problems telling you to reorder your, uh, reorder your, so here we say public static final. Can we say final public static? Technically we could, but it's sort of run upon, right? The order is like this. So you, you know, the, the linter will help you. So the linter if sees, okay, you, you declaring something out of order, it will tell you, yeah, you put, you should put private before final, right? Um, okay. All the Java people, do you know all the modifiers? Which one do you want me to tell you about? Transient and volatile. Uh, then do that, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, exactly. So th those are kind of heavy topics. <laughs> so those are kind of uh, heavy uh, related to um, to locking and memory access. It, it's similarly heavy in C++. In C++, you have more control over the, the access modifiers in, term, in the multi-threaded environment. Uh, so I don't think you will, in this course, you will have to deal with these two. Um, I can talk about it later, but uh, yeah, for it's too complex, yeah? Exactly, so that one is kind of an interesting one, right? So um, final, um, you know, you don't have final in, in uh, C++. What do you have in C++? Const, right? So you often, um, you often think of, um, in C++ to be roughly final uh, in Java. It's not kind of true, okay? Um, so if I say I have a final class uh, A, what does it mean? It means that I cannot have a subclass of A and I cannot change the, the declaration of A. So the type A is always A. So if I have inheritance or if I have some sort of a type uh, casting to interfaces and things, I am guaranteed that A is always A and the behavior, all the methods and things that are called on A are the ones which I seal with the, um, with the keyword final here, right? So if you want to write some behavior that will never be overwritten uh, in the sort of um, overwrite um, um, a model of uh, dynamic linking of methods, then you pre prefix it with fine, right? Okay, I can do a public class, so I can have an, a normal public class, uh, that, that one was public, public final, right? Um, I can have a public class which is not final, but I can say I have a public method uh, which is final, and I don't know, method M, okay? What does that mean? Well, it means that A can have a subclass, right? It, has, it can be overridden, but M cannot be overridden. So if I have a chain of types and I call dot M, I'm guaranteeing that, uh, I'm guaranteeing that this behavior is being executed, right? So if, for example, I don't know, you're dealing with passwords or things like that and you want to make sure that it's always dealt the same way, then you say final and then therefore your class hierarchy will not allow this behavior to be overridden, right? Um, so up to now, it's sort of similar to, um, it, it's not really similar, but, you know, if I had a method, uh, if I had a method const um, for in C++, what does it mean? What would that mean, yeah? 
It could be nine, but it's not. That's not what it means. What it means, yeah. That it wouldn't change the stuff. In exactly. The that it doesn't have side effects. It will not change stuff in the class, right? That's why it can be inline because it doesn't have side effects, right? It doesn't depend on the state of the of the class. So with final, but there is no, you know, there is no link. They, they are two completely different, right? Okay. So up to now, they were sort of not the same at all. Okay, so what if I have, if I say I have a const um, in a equals one, and if I say final uh, int a equals one in Java, what, that, what does it mean? Yes, what it means is that in my code, if I say a equals two, the compiler will say, <laughs> Come on, what are you doing? You said it's constant, right? So you cannot redefine it. Here, it's exactly the same, right? It will say, no, 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 you, you cannot redefine A, right? Uh, a is one and it has to stay one, okay? So in this case, they are exactly the same, okay? Right, so let's do something similar. Let's have, um, let's have a class, public class A that has a public um, field f okay which which is one okay and it has a public method m which does something okay and the public method m let's say it changes f to two okay so i have a class a which has a field and a method and then if i call the method the the field is changed okay and now i will say i have an instance of a uh which is a And I will call it const, and I will call it final. Okay, so now, can I do a uh, dot f equals two in C++? Can I do that? Yeah, but what, what that means? So can I call it? Can I do this? No. Can I do a dot m in C plus plus? Can I do this? It will change the state. So I cannot, right? So here I, I am not allowed to do neither of those two things, right? In Java, can I do this? Yes. Can I do this? Yes. Can I do in C++, can I do A equals new, um, new A? Can I redefine A? No. In, C++, in, in Java, can I do A equals new A? No. Right? So in Java and C++, these are the same. They, the final prevents me to redefine what A is, but it doesn't prevent me to change the state of the class, of the instance. The Java is fine with those two calls. Those two calls, where you can do whatever you want inside A. You cannot touch the, the reference A. You cannot do this, right? Um, so it, it is, you know, in some cases it's exactly the same, like here it's exactly the same, and in the previous is the um, int case, it was exactly the same, but sometimes it's not, and especially this is confusing people, because they think if they declare something final, that means A will not change, but it will. It can change freely, right? It doesn't mean the inside of A cannot change, it can. And you can change it directly by just redefining the value of the field, or calling a method which redefines it. Right, both of those are fine. You have to keep controlling the final thing. That's right, exactly. So in Java, if you were to prevent people messing up with this to be a final, you have to say final, right? And that that means nobody can then, you know, even in Java, this is not legal anymore, right? And if you, but, and this would not be legal because you cannot redefine F even here, right? Mm -hmm. 
So that means that line cannot be filled, right? If you declared, okay, that's final, that's sealed. Yeah, there was a question. It just reminds me of con consequences. Exactly, exactly. So con con pointer in that case is what it is, what yeah, final is, right? Then you are actually comparing the same thing. That's now right. So if you have a pointer, um, yeah. Yeah, you probably, I don't remember where the cons needs to be for a coins pointer, right? <laughs> probably needs to be here. Yeah. Um, but then it's the same. That means you cannot redefine the, the pointer, but you can mess up with the instance, right? Then the, those two lines, if this is a cons, coins pointer, then you can still do that, right? In C++. Because you're not sealing the content of A, you're just sealing the pointer. Yeah? Yeah? So this is a bit redundant. Uh, what actual uh, in between you feel like to seal the content as well. That's right. You can it on the correct place to seal the content. That's right. So you can seal the both the con the content and the and the uh, pointer if you want. So you can use uh, cons twice, right? Which is the fun of C because you have the control of everything you want to do, right? Uh, but then again, it it makes it somewhat com complex. Um, say it again. Why would you? So you don't you prevent somebody redefining the the pointer to like to reassign it to a different value and messing up with the content of a. That's why you would use twice. Yeah, I'm running out of battery. Um, but I only have one more slide, so I think, um, yeah, so that's about the project. So that's great. Um, so I will um, shut, shut the...